Hey everybody, John Greenwald here with TheBlackVault.com. As always, thank you so much for tuning in and making this your live stream or your podcast of choice. Now, I was a little apprehensive about putting this to an audio version, so if you're listening to that, just know I wasn't so sure if I should. Only reason is lots of visuals to look at, but I know that a lot of you just don't care about that aspect and want me to uh, drop them to audio anyway, so there you go. If you want to see the visuals, just go to the blackvault.com slash live. That will bounce you to the YouTube channel. That way you can uh, see some of the recent videos and likely find this one on the Guy Hoddle memo. And with that, that is what we are talking about today. I will say that when I posted what what I call the short, it was like a minute long. It goes to not only YouTube shorts, but also to now TikTok. Uh, lots of people were requesting I be on there, mainly my sister. So a shout out to her. Uh, but but she was seeing a lot of people talking about the Black Vault, using Black Vault hashtags. So I finally got suckered into doing it. But it's been a lot of fun and challenging to create short form content. But I know a lot of you don't use TikTok. I've heard the concerns and the privacy concerns and so on. And maybe it's just me after 26 years of doing this, I just kind of waved goodbye to much of my privacy anyway. So uh, I, it doesn't really bother me at all. Plus I didn't really see a whole lot of promise in some of the claims made against TikTok anyway. But that being said, I joined that, but take those shorts. So don't worry if you, if you don't use TikTok, you'll see them on Instagram started posting there as well, but also here on YouTube, if you're watching the video on YouTube. So you're not missing out. But my whole point is, is that when I drop this short form video, my intent was to do this longer form video to go along with it. Some of you who pay attention to these channels probably saw that with the Bigfoot video that I did. Drop the short, drop the longer version. That way, everybody gets what they want. Some want short form, some want long form. So bam, that's what I decided to do. With this particular one, life got in the way. As most of you know, I'm a dad. I've got a three-year-old and an eight-year-old. Things always don't go as planned. Uh, scheduling beyond an hour into my future is generally pretty tough to do. So it didn't work out. But I'm kind of glad it didn't. Because with that being said and that delay, I got to see two things. One, the reaction from some people out there to the short form video, which I was, I would say, surprised that some people accused me of actually making up this document, that it wasn't real. Uh, so it was interesting to see those types of comments because this document is absolutely real and very provable. But the second part of why I'm happy that I got delayed was some news. And that is for those who know what I'm going to be talking about, the HODL memo, I got a version from the FBI released just this morning of it entirely unredacted. Now, there weren't a whole lot of redactions, I'll show you in a moment, but I got those redactions lifted. And what that revealed were the names of those involved beyond Guy Hoddle, who was the special agent in charge in Washington, D.C. So that is a little bit of news for you. That was, again, hot in today uh, through FOIA. I will show you that in the coming minutes, but wanted to kind of preface the story of what we're going to be talking about. So let me go ahead and pull up the visuals. If you're not familiar with the Guy Hoddle memo, this is something that has been around for many, many years in the UFO conversation. Some even call it a smoking gun. Others call the story that's depicted in the document, because I want to stress the document is real. There is no denying that. But the story within, some believe, is a hoax. Now, I'm going to outline everything for you at least as, as much as is presently known about this document, and let you guys decide. I'm, I'm not really here to tell you one way or the other. Of course, I'm skeptical. Of course, I lean towards, ah, it's probably not real. But the new revelation of, of those redactions being lifted may actually cause more questions to be generated than questions answered. We'll get to that, like I said, in a few moments. 
The memo itself is this. It is a one page memorandum and we're going to dissect it here just so you guys know on the audio version exactly what we are talking about. It was dated March 22nd, 1950. And you can see up here it was addressed to the director of the FBI, which you can imagine was uh, J. Edgar Hoover. And it was from Guy Hoddle, SAC means special agent in charge in Washington, D.C. The subject, flying saucers, information concerning. Let me read it to you. The following information was furnished to SA or special agent and then redacted. For those listening on the audio version, it's about equal to um, a line and a half of redaction stretching over three lines. So we don't know what's under that new paragraph. An investigator for the Air Forces stated that three so-called flying saucers had been recovered in New Mexico. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers, approximately 50 feet in diameter. Each one was occupied by three bodies of human shape, but only three feet tall, dressed in metallic cloth of a very fine texture. Each body was bandaged in a manner similar to the blackout suits, suits used by speed flyers and that pilots and test pilots, excuse me, it's type writers a little hard to read here. According to Mr. Redacted informant, the saucers were found in New Mexico due to the fact that the government has a very high powered radar set up in that area. And it is believed the radar interferes with controlling mechanics of the saucers. No further evaluation was attempted by SA and then blank concerning the above. And then uh, that's the end of the memo. Sorry for my tongue tied there. It's sometimes hard to read on my monitor of a monitor uh, uh, broadcasting to you guys, uh, especially when it's from 1950. But anyway, that is the memorandum. Fresh in today is the memorandum unredacted. I will dissect the line that's unredacted towards the end of this. Uh, but for now, let me read it to you. The following information was furnished to Special Agent R. H. Kurtzman by Carl Howe. Special Investigator, Sex Squad, Metropolitan Police Department. And then it goes on. I've already read the rest to you. Uh, the other redactions cited when I read the whole thing were just the same names in the first paragraph, but cited in paragraphs three and four. So there you go. A little bit of a mystery revealed on who the source actually was. But before I get into that, I want to Again, just outline the memorandum here because this part is new. So I didn't update all my slides. So I'm going to go back to that original one because I already did the graphics. And then I'll come back to that, that new information just to kind of add where we are. But I think the history behind this is absolutely important. Here you can see a side by side of both documents. Uh, you can see it's a much cleaner version as well. So that was kind of nice. Everything else matches up. You can see some handwriting here that was redacted. You couldn't really read it anyway, uh, but here it is revealed. Uh, flying discs or flying saucers, what was uh, handwritten at the top here. And then of course, all of those redactions are lifted. So as I briefly mentioned before, it was written by Guy Hoddle. He was the head of the Washington DC FBI field office and he addressed it to the director of FBI, which again was J, uh, uh, J, J. Edgar Hoover. The document itself, as I also mentioned, has been around for a long time. In fact, decades it has circulated. And it really didn't, I would say, get a lot of online recognition until about eight or nine years ago. And the reason is, is that's when the FBI had launched what they called the vault. I've always joked about that on this channel. What a convenient name. But they launched their archive of government documents and called it the vault. In it are various FBI files on organizations, on people, um, all sorts of things. And, and there's a lot of information. It's, it's, it's a great resource. Um, I've, I've learned it's not always complete. They lead you to believe it's complete, let's say, on a certain person. Uh, or organization that is not true. That's a video for another day. Uh, but regardless, it's a good resource to kind of cross reference and see what has been released before. On there is a file of Guy Hoddle. Let me read to you what how they describe him. Guy Hoddle was a special agent in charge of the FBI's Washington field office. The information concerning Mr. Hoddle 
is in regard to a March 22, 1950 memo he sent to the FBI director concerning flying saucers. See, and then there's a web address, which I will also show you, which links to a 2013 article, UFOs and the Guy Hoddle memo. In March of 2013, the FBI wrote this to kind of explain a little bit about this memo, because when it popped up in their vault, unless you were a UFO history buff, read about it in books, because it, it, it again was nothing new, the internet grabbed a hold of it and went, oh my goodness, this is the smoking gun. So the FBI went, okay, we got to do some PR damage control here and made this 2013 article to help explain that memorandum because it did go viral at the time. Here are just some of the headlines being picked up by the Times, Huffington Post, uh, NBC News, and this was worldwide because a lot of people, well, they, they wanted to know if this truly was a smoking gun. So let's outline what the FBI's explanation actually was. And these are quotes, quote, first, the HODL memo isn't new. It was first released publicly in the late 1970s and had been posted on the FBI website for several years prior to the launch of the vault. Second, the HODL memo is dated nearly three years after the infamous events in Roswell in July 1947. There's no reason to believe the two are connected. The FBI file on Roswell, another popular page, is posted elsewhere on the vault. Prior to the vault, just a quick side note, uh, was something very similar, just not as well known or well publicized. So that's what they mean that it was posted years before uh, the vault came, came, came about. Back to the quotes. Third, as noted in an earlier story, the FBI has only occasionally been involved in investigating reports of UFOs and extraterrestrials. For a few years after the Roswell incident, Director Hoover did order his agents, at the request of the Air Force, to verify any UFO sightings. That practice ended in July 1950, four months after the HODL memo, suggesting that our Washington field office didn't think enough of that flying saucer story to look into it. Of course, in the normal fashion of any government agency, they have to belittle the topic when probably there's really no justification for that. Because in the 1950s, we know for a fact a lot of documents have been destroyed or lost. This was also prior to the Freedom of Information Act. So we have no idea at that time frame what Hoover and his FBI did with the uh, information that could potentially contradict that. Because a lot of other agencies, their information does contradict statements like that. Back to the quotes. Finally, the HODL memo does not prove the existence of UFOs. It is simply a second or third hand claim that we never investigated. Some people believe the memo repeats a hoax that was circulating at the time, but the Bureau's files have no information to verify that theory. They end the article, sorry, no smoking gun on UFOs. The mystery remains. The key part of that for me is the mystery. The FBI couldn't truly explain where this story came from. Hopefully I'm going to be able to add to that today. But with this article, they called it a mystery, even though skeptics and even UFO believers, advocates that the phenomena, these phenomena are real and something worthy of study. Uh, even some of them are saying, no, nah, no, nah, it's, it's, a, it's a hoax. And they largely reference this man, Silas Newton. The quote at the top here, some people believe the memo repeats a hoax that was circulating at that time, but the Bureau's files have no information to verify that theory. Here's what's interesting, because again, Silas Newton has largely been connected to the story depicted in this memo. And who knows, that could very well be true. But with all the information that the FBI had access to, either classified or exempt from release and otherwise, back in 2013, they could not verify that Silas Newton played any role in that. This was the man here. You can see there was major headlines all around because he was a big con man at the time. Silas Newton jailed here to face bunco charges. He's primarily known for selling something called the doodle bug. That's a device that I guess can... can detect oil and gold. And I mean, it was a big scam. And essentially, it was 
at the time said to have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but would sell it to people for like $40,000. And those rich people would essentially think that they're getting some kind of a deal. He called it the doodle bug. Here's a picture of it. Haven't found many of them, but this is a rare one of it. And this is what essentially he was, he was really in a lot of trouble for because it was a, a fairly big scam. I'll apologize to Dr. Bruce Maccabee in advance if it wasn't him, but I believe just through research, I, I uh, wasn't able to get a hold of him for this, but um, I believe that the Silas Newton connection roots to Dr. Maccabee back around the time frame that he wrote the FBI CIA UFO connection. And to his credit, uh, he got a lot of those original FBI UFO files that came out decades ago, including the HODL memo. So that is is absolutely a props to him for doing that decades ago. But I believe, again, that Silas Newton connection uh, roots with Dr. Maccabee, but the FBI couldn't bear that out. I did dig up Silas Newton's FBI file. That's also on the FBI's vault as well. I did confirm with the FBI that that is complete, meaning what you find on the vault, what you find on the black vault, that would be my site. Uh, that is the full Silas Newton file. There's nothing else. I won't go and dissect that file, but there's quite a bit to read. I put on, on screen here his arrest record and some of the charges that he faced. Um, a lot of stuff through New York. You can see Sheriff's Department in Los Angeles, Denver, and so on. There's also a lot of resources out there of newsletters that you can find. You can see they even labeled them flying saucer swindlers. Uh, the story is pretty deep. It, it's a, truly a, a video and even a documentary in itself to show what Silas Newton did, what his con was, who he worked with, so on and so forth. And it just kind of spirals from there. So again, I'm not going to dissect that whole thing, but there's lots of resources there if you're curious about it, because it is really a fascinating story. I always loved those con men. Um, 1950s, you know, stories where they got away with so much uh, eventually to be caught, but still fascinating nonetheless. So let's get back to the news for today that the HODL memo has now been released in full. Here it is again. You can see much cleaner than the previous version released. That first paragraph that I already had read to you revealed the names of two key players in this saga. The first is special special agent R. H. Kurtzman. And he was the one that essentially got the information, fed it to the agent in charge at his field office, who then in turn sent it to J. Edgar Hoover. So now we can uh, see who that was, who the special agent received it from. This is what I was trying to unlock. And this to my, I would say biggest surprise, was that it was not anybody that we recognized in like a silence, Silas Newton or uh, something to that effect, but rather the information came from another law enforcement agency, namely the Metropolitan Police Department, and I think that's safe to assume, would be the Washington, D.C. Metro Police Department. Special Investigator Carl Howe was the one who obtained the information, uh, and he was part of, get this, the Sex Squad. Now, why he would come up uh, with the information depicted in the Guy Hoddle memo of alien bodies and so on, and he worked in a sex squad unit, uh, I have no idea. So where my surprise comes in, and, and of course, this is guess, guesswork when you deal with redactions, was that I assumed that the first part of the redaction was the FBI agent. And I actually thought that they likely wouldn't unredact that, that they would keep that redacted even if the guy was dead, meaning a lot of times these agencies will protect their agents. But what I was hoping for was the source, let's say it's Silas Newton, long, long, long passed away, dead, and, and no longer a privacy issue concern. That's what I was looking for. But to my surprise, to see another law enforcement agency, uh, that to me was intriguing. And on top of that, this was obviously, and I want to say obviously, but it is a, a, a with 99% certainty, the Washington DC Metropolitan Police Department reason is, is because when a Metro PD 
gets information. They feel that there should be federal involvement. They go to the field office locally, then locally goes to their national headquarters. And that's what you see here. You trace it back from DC Metro Police to Special Agent Kurtzman, uh, back to the special agent in charge, then to the director of the FBI. So I think it's a safe assumption. But of course, there's always that 1% chance that it's wrong. But regardless, here is R. H. Kurtzman, Robert H. Kurtzman to be exact. He died back in 1978. I found him listed in a document that I got from the FBI called the Dead List. And yes, that is really their name for it. It is the Dead List. This is used by the Freedom of Information Act office when people do FOIA requests or Privacy Act requests or looking for information. They keep a database of people that they have verified are dead. So you have to submit obituaries, death certificates, proof of death in the form of news articles and so on and so forth. And to do that, you, you, you have to submit it to the FBI and it has to be verifiable. Once it's verified, it goes into the list. So uh, Robert Kurtzman, the special agent that received this information, Either somebody requested his file before, and I believe that's true, but I haven't been able to verify if there is a file that's come out yet. I'm working on that. We'll see if there's anything in Kurtzman's file. It's probably nothing related to this, but you never know. Uh, so that's, that's him, found, verified. There you go. The other aspect is the Metropolitan Police Department in Washington, D.C. Now, what's interesting about this is that it didn't immediately root to a Silas Newton, as I pointed out, but rather a police department. So this morning, I immediately picked up the phone and called the police department over in DC and uh, ended up having to leave a message where I ended up asking about files from 1950. Reason being is we want to see what their files, if they still exist, say, hopefully through either a Sunshine Act or a Freedom of Information Act, or maybe through public affairs, they'll work with me because it's 70 plus years uh, since these, these documents were written. Maybe they will release them. Will those files have something to do with either Silas Newton or a story dealing with Silas Newton's claims and so on and so forth? Who knows? That's still up in the air. But it, it to me, this kind of deepened the mystery a little bit. That doesn't mean the HODL memo depicts you know real events and this is a smoking gun, but rather it wasn't what I expected. And that is the very, very kind of cool thing about it. Remember that arrest record that I also talked to you guys about with Silas Newton? It really didn't touch D.C. or any problems that he had in D.C. You can see here that the department that he was charged with on various charges, New York City, New York, New York, New York, Los Angeles, Los Angeles, Denver, Los Angeles, all the way from 1931 through 1967. The 1950 time frame when this intelligence was collected from the field by a sex unit special agent, for whatever reason, uh, that would lie in the timeline here. And you can see 1936 jumps to 52, no real trouble in 1950. So again, may not be directly Silas Newton. Maybe it's somebody that he knew, heard about, uh, who knows, uh, a lot of possibilities there. But regardless, I would say more questions than answers on this one. At first, I, I thought this was just kind of I guess a, a geeky cool thing, if you want to call it that. I was talking to my uh, to my friend Dan Warren, and shout out to him. Runs a cool TikTok channel. With, God, he's he's killing it over there with like a, well over a quarter of a million subscribers. So if you don't know Dan, uh, follow him on TikTok. If you do use TikTok, if not, don't worry about it. But uh, follow him over there. But anyway, what I told him I was like, hey, this is like a geeky cool thing. What I call a geeky cool because I'm a geek. I love this kind of stuff. But then I realized, hey, this actually adds more to the story, maybe not national newsworthy, but rather more to this mystery as the FBI calls it. So hoax, I don't know, you guys decide, you know, I'm always interested in your comments. If you're listening on YouTube, you know where to put them. Just look down south there, you'll see all the comments already. Add your own, let me know. If you think it's all BS, hey, let me know. The document though itself is real. So those who commented on the short saying that I made this up and was looking for clickbait, no, it's all verifiable. You guys can verify it. 
but the question mark is what is within and that is what we don't know so put those comments below if you're listening on the audio podcast version thanks for doing so please help me out add one of those reviews wherever you're listening itunes spotify wherever it is those are huge helps to me and more than all else helping spread the word sharing these links telling others about the black vault and these types of discoveries where things come out that as of today had never been known before. Very cool stuff. So thank you all for listening, watching, and your support. It truly, truly means more to me than I've ever than I can ever explain in a podcast or a video. So thank you for that. With all that said, this is John Greenwald Jr. signing off, and we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>